don't think I really need to say anything else after Scott's, Scott's talk and that prayer. I think I'm done. You can all go home early. Um, next one. Um, if you ask somebody how their week's been, how do they normally respond? Busy. Yeah, so that was fast. That was <laughs> al al almost, almost like we planned that, but we didn't. Uh, everybody's busy. I'm busy all the time. You're probably busy all the time. Um, old people are busy. Young people are busy. Uh, my retired parents are somehow really busy all the time. Um, my eight-year-old son a few nights ago said he was really stressed because he was so busy and he had too much to do. <laughs> he literally had nothing to do, but he, was, he had apparently had too much to do. Everybody's busy. Um, every night I collapse on the sofa about 10 p.m., having worked constantly since 6 a.m., um, seemingly without a break. Um, at work, it's good to be as busy as possible because, uh, you know, being, being busy is more productive, makes more money. That's what we want to do. And then I get home and it's, uh, the work doesn't stop. There's still a never-ending list of things to do um, and none of them can be started until, you know, um, and then it gets to the weekend and it doesn't get any easier. I might not work for my employer, in theory, um, but, you know, the wonky curtain pole needs fixed and the laundry needs done and the ironing needs done and the bathrooms need cleaned and um, there's a never-ending list of things to do. We're always busy. We've, we've got smartphones that are meant to make our lives easier, but they've just made us busier. We just, we just do more. Well, we just push our brains already way past their busyness limit even more. And we use every free moment of our lives to make sure we're as busy as possible. Reading BBC News on the toilet. I can't be the only one. Uh, checking Facebook over dinner. Even listening to a podcast while exercising. We have to make sure we're as, as busy as possible. It's no wonder we have really high levels of stress and insomnia and burnout and anxiety and even mental breakdown. So this busyness is not good for us. It's not good for our bodies. But more than that, it's not good for our souls. It's been described as violence to our souls. When we're, when we're busy, we're hurrying all the time. And that, um, when, when we're that busy, it stops us from praying. It stops us from taking the time to really pray, listen to God's voice. It also stops us from really seeing the people around us and taking the time to notice them and love them well. And it uses up our time. Uh, it makes the days go quickly, the years go quickly, and we can miss out on, on the joy of life. Is, but is that the way it has to be? Is that the way God wants it to be? Um, that's the way our society has become, but as a church, can we offer something better, something different? Spoiler alert, I think we can. Um, we can offer Sabbath. I think Sabbath is how we, is how we, can, we can fight against that. Is this going to work, Timothy? Oh, we went one too many. There we go. So we're going to talk about Sabbath this morning. We're going to talk about four facets of, of Sabbath. Sabbath is about rest. Sabbath is about worship. Sabbath is about trust. And lastly, Sabbath is for you. So let's talk about rest. And let's start with the Bible. So in Exodus chapter 20, we have the Ten Commandments. And one of the commandments says this. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So God commanded the Israelites to stop and rest one day a week. Men, women, foreigners, even animals, everyone was to stop. And for the Israelites that was from uh, sunset on Friday till sunset on Saturday. The word Sabbath comes from Hebrew word Shabbat, which is normally translated to stop. Um, so we need to stop. God's commanded a, a regular drumbeat of rest in our lives. He knows, that, he knows that we need it. And so much so that it, 
you know, as we just read, it's, it's written into the very fabric of creation. God created, God stopped. We work, we stop. So this morning, let's think about what, what are some of the things that we might need to stop from, that we're struggling to stop. Working is the obvious one. Um, you know, whether that be as, as a job or a volunteer capacity or your caring responsibilities, um, you, need a, you need a rest. We all need a rest sometimes. Um, busyness there is, is, is the big one. So if, if busyness is this, is this violence to our souls, then Sabbath is how we, we resist that violence. Sabbath is how we start to heal from that violence and the damage it does to us. If, if busyness stops us from praying, then Sabbath is how we begin to tune into God's voice again. And if busyness makes us self-centered and not seeing the people around us, then Sabbath is how we stop and see the people around us and notice them and start to love them well. And if busyness sucks the joy out of life and makes the years go by too quickly, Sabbath is how we resist that. We stop and we live life to the full. Um, maybe it's striving, worrying, planning, stressing that we need to stop from. I remember I, I tried to Sabbath before and um, decided that I was going to stop for a day and spent the entire day stressing about what I was going to do the next day when I was allowed to do stuff and spent most of the day on my phone making to-do lists and planning what, exactly what I was going to do and stressing about it. And that wasn't restful, that wasn't, that wasn't Sabbath. Or maybe it's studying and exercising, which are good things, and you know, for seasons in life, we do lots of those things, and that's all good. But maybe for, those, maybe for you, those things become too much, and you need to stop and rest sometimes. So just take a moment just now. What, what do you need to rest from? I'm not going to ask for hands up. Um, but have a think. What, what do you need to rest from in your life? Try and bring something to mind. But why do we rest? And what do we do when we're, what we're meant to do when, when we're resting? Well, Sabbath is also about worship. If we look at the same text again, I've highlighted a little bit in the middle that says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. There's an aspect of it that is about God. So the word Shabbat, as well as being translated to stop, can also be translated to delight. So we stop and we delight. God stopped from his work of creation and God delighted in his work of creation. So we stop and we delight, we rest and we worship. That's what Sabbath is all about. It's, it's not just a day off. I mean, days, days off are really good, but on a day off is typically when we stop doing all our employer work, potentially, and, and do all the other things that we maybe don't get paid for. Um, you know, we go to Ikea, somehow lose, an, lose a whole day in Ikea. You know, we run errands, we pay bills, we cut the grass, do the laundry, all those things we catch up with on a day off. They're all good activities, but those activities don't make a Sabbath. We need to stop and delight. We need to both rest and worship. And when I say worship, I don't mean standing singing songs all day, because that would be a long day, potentially, uh, for those of us that can't sing very well. Um, but, you know, we maybe need to expand our vision of what Sabbath worship is all about. So, John Mark Comer, who recently wrote a book about all of this stuff, um, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, he offers this definition of Sabbath worship. Anything to index your heart towards grateful recognition of God's reality and goodness. So that, maybe for you that's having a meal with friends. Maybe for you that is going a walk in nature. Um, it's going to be different for different people. Um, some people uh, for some people, exercise is a chore, and it's definitely not a delight, delightful, worshipful experience. Other people would love to you know, go a run in the hills and experience nature and, and, and run and pray and enjoy creation. Um, likewise, for some people like me, gardening is the worst of all chores. Uh, and not a worshipful, delightful thing to do. And other people, that's when they get away from it all and they get into the garden, they spend time with their plants and enjoy, enjoy that um, as a hobby. So when do you stop and delight in God? I try and have a think. What, what recharges your batteries? What is it that 
What is it that makes you delight in God and stop and worship? The third facet that we're going to look at is trust. Sabbath is about trust. Um, Elsewhere in Exodus, we read this. This is when God was providing uh, manna from heaven, miraculous bread for the Israelites in the wilderness. Um, And it says here, On the sixth day they gathered twice as much food, two omers per person, and all the leaders of the community came and told Moses. He said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a time of cessation from work, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Whatever you want to bake, bake today. Whatever you want to boil, boil today. Whatever is left, put aside for yourselves to be kept until morning. So they put it aside until the morning, just as Moses had commanded. And it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Normally it did stink and had worms in it the next day, but not not on the Sabbath. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find any in the area. Six days you will gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather it, but they found nothing. So God wanted the Israelites to trust that what they had gathered on the six days would be enough. Um, But some people weren't very good at that. They didn't trust, and they went out on the seventh day anyway to try and gather some more. Um, And I think it's the same with us. God wants us to trust that what we can do in, in the six days or in a, in, a, in a section of the week is enough, and we don't have to work all of the time. We can trust. Um, we, we need to trust that God will provide for us. Um, I've got a, a Christian friend who owns a, a, a number of car dealerships, um, and about 10 years ago, he made the big decision to close his car dealership on a Sunday. Um, at the time, he was ridiculed by everybody because um, Sunday is the biggest day for car sales in Scotland, apparently. Um, but he, he's a Christian. He wanted to go to church. He wanted to spend time with his family. Um, and he wanted his employees to be able to do the same. Uh, so he made that, that bold decision to, to trust God. Um, and he says he didn't notice it in his sales. He says that he made as much money in six days as he did in seven it's obviously impossible to know how much money he may have made if he'd, uh, if he'd opened all seven days. Um, but he trusted God. He made that decision um, for, yeah, for his benefit and for his, for his family and for his employees. So when, when we choose to trust God, we're choosing contentment over dissatisfaction, choosing to be content with what we have in six days over that need that we all have for more all of the time. We're choosing gratitude over greed, we're choosing to have this, this margin in our lives, um, this day or this, this time, instead of busyness all the time. We're choosing peace over worry. And we're choosing rest instead of our continual striving. And when we trust that God will provide for us and we stop and Sabbath, we're also trusting that God knows what's best for us, as we talked about. There's two aspects of that, of that trust. We're trusting that even though we might not want to stop, God knows that that we need to, and we trust him. So what do you need to trust God with today? What's stopping you from stopping and delighting, stopping and resting and worshipping? What do you need to trust God with today? Let's look at the fourth facet of Sabbath. Sabbath is for you. And let's read how how Jesus interacted with the Sabbath. Uh, This is from Matthew. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath, and yet yet they are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. 
for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Jesus, if you read the Gospels, Jesus seems to have gone out his way to do miracles on the Sabbath, mainly to wind up the Pharisees, um, but to make a really good point about Sabbath. Um, it had become a very big deal for the Pharisees. And um, what Jesus is saying is that the rules on their own don't work without a framework of love and goodness around them. Um, even it, They've never worked without the framework of love and goodness. Look at David, look at the priests in the temple. Um, the, the rules don't work without the framework of love and goodness. It's love over legalism. Um, they're not rules for the, for the sake of rules uh, that we have to follow, but they're for our good. Um, Mark sums it up uh, in his gospel with Jesus saying, this, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for us, for our good, rather than us being made to serve the, the Sabbath and be a slave to the rules. Um, and it's not a chore, but an invitation. Um, I find it really strange that God has to actually command the Sabbath, like that we don't want to just stop and rest and delight and do the things we enjoy all the time. Um, you'd think God would have to command us to work and do something with our lives, but God commands us to stop and rest. Um, our souls need it. Our souls crave it. Um, the Sabbath is for us. And God invites us, the Sabbath is that invitation to take, to take rest. And it should be the best day of the week. I mean, if, if you, let's take a moment to think back of on, your, on the last year or so, what's, what's the best day you can remember? What's the best day you've had? Try and recall something. Maybe it was a meal with friends that you had that was just really good. Or maybe it was playing frisbee on the beach with your kids that time when they were all behaving for once and it was <laughs> that dream family moment. Um, imagine if you could have you know, 52 of those days per year, whatever you've got in your mind, instead of just you know, that one-off random occasion that sometimes happens if you're lucky. Imagine if we could have a best day of the week, every day, uh, not every day of the week, every week, that would, be, that, that would be good. And Sabbath is in some way inviting us to to, to do that, to stop and delight um, and have those moments. Because, I mean, I don't need to tell you, life is, life is fleeting. The kids grow up fast and the years fly by and um, life passes before our eyes. And Sabbath is our way of resisting that so we don't miss the goodness of life. Um, it's an invitation to slow down and make sure we don't miss that, but we appreciate it and we enjoy it instead of our relentless busyness all the time. So let me take the focus off of the Sabbath being for you and switch to the Sabbath being for you. Um, you might be listening to this thinking, that's great for other people, but I've got a really busy job. Um, there's no way I could stop. Or I've got five kids. There's no way I could possibly, uh, you know, I could possibly take a rest from that. But the Sabbath is for you. Um, it's one of the Ten Commandments. And uh, we, could, we can talk and debate about whether as Christians today we need to obey the Ten Commandments as laws or not. But the fact remains that we, we look at, we look at the, the Ten Commandments, we look at the other nine of them, and we think they're full of wisdom for our lives. They are things that are wise that we should be doing and implementing because they're good for us, they're good for society. Um, and we generally all agree that we should be going with, with the other nine of them. Um, the Sabbath is somehow the forgotten commandment in our society. Um, but Jesus took Sabbath really seriously. As Scott said earlier, he, he didn't just Sabbath one day a week, but he took it to another level. He was always going up the mountain to pray or going out into the wilderness for days, weeks at a time. Um, 
or letting his disciples go on ahead across the lake while he stayed behind uh, and got some alone time. He was always prioritizing that prayer time, that alone time, that rest time. And he was really busy. He had a lot going on and a lot of people following him a lot of the time. Um, and we need to take Jesus seriously as a teacher, not just a savior. It's kind of easy to take him seriously as our savior, but we need to take him really seriously as a teacher. Um, and if we want to follow the way of Jesus, then we need to start to live as he lived. But it's not easy. It's obviously not easy. Um, and God has so much grace for us as we struggle with this in our society. There's no guilt tripping here. Um, and I feel like the worst of all hypocrites because I do not have this under control in my life. Um, but I'm exploring it. And uh, but yeah, it, it requires us to be really intentional and really committed to it. Um, a bit like Christmas Day. So I love Christmas Day. Um, but on Christmas Day, you, you, you plan for it. You know that the shops are going to be shut. So you do your shopping in advance. Um, you, you don't really want to be cleaning the bathrooms on Christmas morning, so you get that done on Christmas Eve um, or the week before. Uh, you, 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 know, you, you, you plan food in advance, you invite friends around for a meal, you do things so that on Christmas Day you have a really good day. Um, and the Sabbath is a bit like that. We can plan for it like that and make sure we have a really good day full of stopping and delighting resting and worshiping um, but it requires us to be really intentional about it so maybe we maybe it's a big step to just down tools and, and sabbath fully but maybe we can take baby steps in that direction and, and maybe get there um, we need to think about what we could do differently this week so let's let's reflect first of all what's the pace of your life like maybe you've got this under control and ever, and you can't really relate to this and everything is, everything's good for you, which, in which case that's great. Um, do you take, but do you take enough time to stop and delight in God? And maybe we can make a practical plan just now, maybe when you go home and talk with your family or maybe now in your head, when will you stop and delight in God this week? Is it gonna be manic, busy, hurrying all the way through or are you gonna stop and delight in God? Can you make a practical change to the rhythm of your life to build in this rest? To stop and delight in God. Maybe you could turn your phone off for a day. That might sound really easy, but I've tried it and it's really hard for me anyway. But when I've managed it, it's really fruitful. Putting my phone away for an evening or for a whole day makes a huge difference. Maybe that's something that would work for you. Maybe you could have a TV free day or a social media free day. Um, to give you that stopping and resting, uh, to take a baby step towards it. Maybe you could arrange a meal with friends this week and have a prayer or worship time or communion time uh, during that meal. And, or maybe you need to get away and spend some time in nature. Or maybe there's something else for you that, that you know would, would be a good step for you to take this week. So have a think. And while you're thinking, let's, let's recap uh, to help shape your thinking. Sabbath is about rest. It's about worship. It's about trusting God. And it's for you. And it is for you. Uh, Walter Brueggemann says, people who keep Sabbath live all seven days differently. So you might find as you start to build this rhythm of, of Sabbath, of stopping and resting into your life, um, that you live all seven days differently, not just one. You might start to uh, choose to slow down and take the pace off of your life on the other six days as well and make more time for prayer, make more time for the people around you, make more time to appreciate the goodness of life and worshipping instead of this relent relentless pursuit for more that we seem to have. You might start to choose gratitude and contentment every day of the week and give yourself that margin in your life um, and you might yeah, slow down, stop, worship, and live life to the full. And I think this is what Jesus was getting at uh, in some way when he says this. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's read that again. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray together to close. Father, thank you so much that you know us, that you love us, that you have given us the Sabbath practice written into the fabric of creation for our good. And we ask that you would help us this week not to feel guilty about the busyness of our lives, but to draw near to you and to learn with your help to stop and to delight, to rest and to worship. Amen.